Well, hello everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Tom Alves. I'm the Head of Development at Ahuri, the Australian Housing and Urban Research Institute. And I'm very delighted to welcome you uh, to this, uh, the third in our Ahuri webinar series. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are meeting today, which obviously are many and varied, but I'm here in uh, Melbourne and I would like to pay my respects to the Woiwurrung and Boonwurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations. And our presenters today are in Sydney and they are on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation. I pay my respects uh, to the elders uh, past and present and emerging, and also um, to the Aboriginal elders who may be joining us for this webinar today. We are very pleased to be able to offer this research webinar series. It's a means of keeping you informed of our latest research and of helping you engage with research findings from our on ongoing program of research. And obviously it's at a time when public face-to-face uh, -face conference and events are not going ahead, of course, and uh, we look forward uh, ultimately to joining you at our face-to-face -face conferences again in future. But this will be the third instalment, as I said, of this series. And if you are interested, our previous webinars are available on the Ahuri website, uh, where you can view a recording of those presentations. Um, our first webinar looked at redesigning the homelessness service system for young people. And our, our last webinar engaged with Australian home ownership and offered past reflections and provided some uh, insight around the future directions of home ownership in Australia. Before we start today's webinar, I want to let you know about the Ahuri COVID-19 Research Hub. Ahuri has created this resource hub as a means of providing you with COVID-19 coverage that relates specifically to housing, homelessness and to urban policy. You may also be aware that we recently announced a special research agenda that was dedicated specifically to the impacts of COVID-19 on the housing market. The details of the new projects that uh, were funded under this round are all included on our resource hub and the details uh, on how to access that are on your screen now. Just before I introduce today's topic and the speakers we have today, I need to provide you just quickly with some instructions on the software that we're using and to also uh, provide a few housekeeping points. Uh, firstly, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, so if you need to leave at some stage during the webinar or if you want to um, share it with a colleague in future, it will be available on Ahuri's website in the coming days. At the end of today's webinar, you'll also receive a survey and we welcome your feedback. In fact, we encourage it and uh, we value this because it helps us to refine and improve future webinars uh, to ensure that we're presenting information that's useful to you. In terms of participating in today's webinar, I'm just gonna give you a few instructions around that. So you're listening um, by default using your computer's speaker system. If you would prefer to do that um, over a phone, then you just need to select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information is displayed there. You will also have the opportunity to submit questions uh, today and you do that by typing in the questions section of the control panel. You can submit your questions at any time during the presentation and we'll uh, start collating those and address them to our presenters uh, at the end of their presentation. Um, so please, as questions occur to you, uh, type them into that question function. There's an option you'll notice to raise your hand and uh, please, we just ask that you disregard that as we won't be using that particular function of the software today. So thank you. Uh, now to uh, today's webinar and uh, today's presenters. So we're delighted to have with us today two of Australia's leading experts on urban development and housing issues. And I welcome uh, here with us uh, Associate Professor Hazel Easthope and Dr. Thank Laura you. Cromelin. Uh, they are so. the lead researchers at UNSW Sydney uh, for this Ahuri report. Um, 
their report investigates the experiences of lower income apartment residents in Australia in relation to planning and infrastructure provision, urban design, building design and management, neighbourhood amenities and facilities, and ongoing place management and community engagement. The full report, along with a policy evidence summary, is now available at the Ahuri website, and the address uh, where you can access that is on your screen now. Hazel Easthope is Scientia Associate Professor at UNSW's City Futures Research Centre. Hazel has a strong record of research on urban consolidation and the development, management, governance and planning implications of apartment buildings. She is a leading researcher in this field and is regularly consulted by industry, government and peak organisations in Australia and overseas. I also welcome Dr Laura Cromelin. Uh, Laura is a research lecturer at the City Futures Research Centre at New South Wales and she is working there on projects related to urban and housing policy and she also teaches planning law in the Faculty, the faculty of Built Environment. To quickly recognise the other um, authors of this report as well, in addition to Hazel and Laura from UNSW, uh, Gethin Davison uh, and Bill Randolph also join us from UNSW, uh, Lawrence Troy from the University of Sydney, and from RMIT University, Megan Nethercote, Sarah Foster, Alexandra Kleeman, and Ralph Horn, and also Ryan van den Nuvelen from Western Sydney University. And a particular welcome to um, those other authors if they're joining us in today's webinar. So thank you. I will now um, turn off my uh, camera and I encourage the uh, presenters to do the same as they take us through the slides that they have prepared. Thank you, Hazel and Laura. Thanks very much, Tom. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. We're building a lot of apartments in Australia and developing new high density precincts across our big cities. One in 10 Australians already live in an apartment and for the first time ever a few years ago, we started building more attached dwellings than other types of dwellings. Apartment living is different to living in a house and these differences bring with them both challenges and benefits. The differences at a building scale include usually smaller dwellings, greater proximity between residents, shared facilities and shared responsibilities for management and upkeep of buildings. And at the neighbourhood scale, density can strain local services, but it can also provide efficiencies and economies of scale. In recent years, we've been building bigger apartment complexes and creating more high density precincts. Apartments house a broad cross section of the population, but in our major cities, compared to other dwelling types, they're more likely to house people on lower incomes. But for the most part, these buildings and neighbourhoods are not designed and managed to adequately support the needs of lower income residents, and this needs to change. Lower income households are disproportionately affected by challenges associated with apartment living, as they often have less choice and less control over where they live. They're particularly affected if their buildings or neighbourhoods are poorly designed or managed, as they have less choice over their living arrangements. And for this reason, it's really important that their needs are considered in our planning and development processes. So how can we improve the design, delivery and management of apartment buildings and precincts so that they better need, meet the needs of lower income households? This was the focus of our research. We had three formal research questions which are summarised on the slide in front of you. Who are lower income, high density apartment residents and where do they live? What influences their experiences of apartment living? And how can we deliver better apartment buildings and neighbourhoods that better meet their needs? Next slide, please. The team um, is, is a large one and spans four universities, UNSW, RMIT, Sydney University and Western Sydney University. I'll start the presentation today and then Laura will take over. And Lawrence is also online and available for questions regarding the data analysis um, and the response to the first research question. Next slide. So what did we do? We had three main uh, methods or approaches which aligned with our three research questions. The first um, was to describe um, and analyse who lower income high density apartment residents are 
We did that at a national scale um, in a descriptive analysis using census data. And then we did more detailed analysis at the Greater Sydney and Greater Metropolitan, uh, sorry, Greater Sydney Metropolitan Area and Greater Melbourne Metropolitan Areas. Um, and that included uh, principal components or cluster analysis of residents using census, as well as descriptive um, analysis of the buildings using both census and land titles. And I'll explain why Sydney and Melbourne in just a moment. We then undertook four in-depth case studies, two in each city, and that included precinct design audits, uh, reviews of documentation, especially planning policies and regulations, interviews with key stakeholders, and interviews and focus groups with lower income residents who live in those areas. And finally, we ran a workshop in each of the two cities with policymakers and practitioners to identify what we could do better. At those workshops, we had local and state government representatives, architects, developers, strata managers, and community service providers represented. Next slide. So who are lower income, high density apartment residents? What is our definition? By lower income, we're talking about uh, people in households at the bottom 40% of household incomes nationally. And by high density, we've chosen the definition of buildings of four plus stories. Now there's a lot of debate about the definition of high density and it's an important debate, but for the purposes of this research, we've settled on the four plus story building definition. And there's a range of data availability and policy reasons for that choice, which are explained in the report. In the next slide, you'll see a graph which um, shows the distribution of household incomes by high density dwellings compared to all other dwellings. What's important to look at on this graph is to compare the coloured sections with the grey sections. The coloured sections are our bottom 40% and the grey are the rest of households. And what you can see is that for each of the major cities with the exception of Darwin, there's a higher proportion of people in um, higher density households in the lower income bands across those major cities. You might note that the uh, difference at the national level is um, less noticeable. And we uh, suspect that that's because of um, higher density apartments along the eastern seaboard uh, waterfront properties, which will have higher household income profiles. Next slide, please. So lower income high density residents are more likely to be born overseas. They're more likely to be unemployed or not in the labor force, to be lone person households and to be renting. But importantly, many lower income high density residents don't meet these criteria. And you can see that in the brackets underneath. So what we're talking about here is a really diverse um, profile of residents. Next slide. So of all of the dwellings in the country in four or more storey buildings, over 70% of those are in greater metropolitan Sydney and Melbourne. And that's the reason why we chose to focus our research in those two cities. As you'll see in the next slide, the distribution of um, these types of dwellings across Sydney uh, is quite different to that in Melbourne. In Sydney, we find these types of dwellings spread right across the metropolitan area. So all of those pink and red areas um, are areas with higher density dwellings. And in the next slide, you'll see that for Melbourne, the focus is much more around the CBD. So they're quite different profiles. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So in order to identify different statistical clusters of lower income, high density households, and which sets of socioeconomic characteristics are associated with each group, we undertook a principal component analysis. And this slide shows the types of variables that were included in that analysis. So we looked at the resident population across greater metropolitan Melbourne and greater metropolitan Sydney of people on household incomes in the lower two quintiles, living in four plus story buildings and doing uh, this submarket analysis. In the next slide, you'll see that we identified five key submarkets in Sydney and four in Melbourne. There are some similarities between them, but also some differences. <clears throat> 
We then mapped the identifiable or significant clusters of lower income high density submarkets. So that's the top 30% of clusters in those groups across both cities. And we used these maps to get a picture of where different subgroups were living across both cities and also to help us to choose our case study areas. What we found is that multiple low income apartment subgroups are often found living in the same locations and they're living alongside apartment residents on higher incomes. And what that means is that the diversity of apartment residents living in different areas of these cities is one of the challenges in effectively planning for and delivering these developments. So it's not that all lower income residents are living together and that the quality of the buildings and the services they're living in are necessarily lower. But it's that lower income residents are living across a broad range of neighbourhoods. And the issue is that they're likely to experience those neighbourhoods differently from people on higher incomes. And also, as we found out through our case studies, outcomes for lower income apartment residents are very variable across neighbourhoods. And that in itself is also an equity issue. Next slide. So we tried to choose case studies that were dissimilar from each other in terms of how they were delivered. And we also wanted to choose case studies where there were multiple submarkets living in the area. We chose central city case studies in Melbourne and suburban um, case studies in Sydney, reflecting the, the profile of the buildings across those two cities. And within each city, we decided that we wanted two case studies that were in the same local government area or council area. That enabled us to do a more in-depth analysis of underlying planning policies and strategies, but also to see how different outcomes can result even within very similar planning environments within the same local government area. Next slide. So the Sydney case studies you can see here on the map, they are Rhodes West and Strathfield Triangle. And in the next slide, you'll see the Melbourne case studies, um, which are North and South Carlton, just uh, near the CBD. Next slide. So, you can see here that Rhodes West um, has three identifiable subgroups from our analysis, international students and millennials, lower income workers in private housing and retirees. The proportion of lower income households who live in Rhodes West is similar to that in New South Wales and Australia, but the proportion of higher income households, sorry, of high income households and higher is higher and median incomes are above state averages. So what this shows us is that this area is actually very diverse in terms of income with some people on very high incomes living alongside people on lower incomes. Rhodes West is a new area that was previously industrial lands and it was developed beginning in the late 1990s and well into the 2010s. Our next case study on the next slide is Upper Strathfield. Upper Strathfield has the same three um, submarkets uh, of lower income, high density uh, residents living within it. Median personal income is lower in Upper Strathfield than for New South Wales and Australia, but median household income is higher, which points to a significant number of households housing multiple lower income residents. The area was previously dominated by detached houses up until the early 2000s, but many apartment buildings have been completed since then. There are also multiple sites where there were previously houses that have been cleared, but then left undeveloped for more than 10 years, despite many having development approval for apartment buildings. In Melbourne, our first case study is South Carlton. On the next slide. Um, in South Carlton, median personal incomes are almost four and a half times lower than at state and national levels, and median household incomes three and a half times lower. The area has private and public housing as well as student accommodation. There are four plus storey apartments along with lower rise apartments and terrace houses in the area. And it's part of an urban renewal area under state level strategic planning, the City North Structure Plan, which provides a plan for 30 years from 2011 to renew the area as an extension of the CBD. Essentially, this plan is formalising a gentrification process in the area that was already underway before it was introduced. And there are two subgroups um, 
in this area, international students and millennials, uh, unsurprising given the, the uh, proximity to universities as well as retirees. And our fourth and final case study on the next slide, Carlton North. Median personal incomes here are half of the state and national levels and median household incomes are a third. 100% of residents in this area live in apartments. There was a public housing renewal program approved in 2007 and the Carlton Housing Redevelopment, which is providing a mix of public and private apartments, has been ongoing since then and is expected to be completed later this year. Some high-rise public housing dwellings have also been retained and upgraded in the area. So next slide. Um, as you can see from those previous slides, we had some quite different case studies and we learned quite a lot about them. In our case studies, we spoke with lower income residents about how they experience living there and the factors that influence those experiences. And we also spoke with key stakeholders about how well their areas cater to the needs of lower income residents and what factors influence this. And we organised our analysis under these headings that you can see on the slide, which as you can see, span scales from the individual dwelling to the building and the neighbourhood, and also span a range of issues across the provision of services and infrastructure, design, management, and community engagement. And now on the next slide, I'll pass you to Laura. Thanks, Hazel. So the final stage of the research that we did involved uh, trying to work through what we should do about uh, some of the issues identified during the case study analysis. And we had the uh, workshops with policy makers and practitioners to try and do that in both Sydney and Melbourne. And across those workshops, we, we ultimately identified these sort of five broad tensions that were points in the development and management process where issues seemed to arise in how, uh, how these case study areas were operating. So I'm just gonna now step through these five uh, key tensions and give you a few examples of the kinds of issues and also some uh, suggestions around the sorts of things that um, needed to be addressed. Next slide, please. So starting with uh, the development phase and the operational phase, this tension really speaks to the uh, challenges between getting what we need done during the development phase to ensure that a building or a neighbourhood is set up well for the operational phase and highlighting some of the ways in which things that happened during development didn't always produce the best outcomes once buildings and neighbourhoods were up and running. Poor development decisions uh, included things like uh, developments and designs that set up residents to uh, and particular owners to uh, be burdened with uh, ongoing and extensive maintenance costs and that's obviously something that's particularly challenging if you have low income owners. Uh, example of that that uh, came up was for example a large lighting uh, installation in a foyer of a building that ultimately required scaffolding every time a light bulb needed changing. Things like that, that obviously weren't fully thought through in terms of how the longer term operation of the building would play out. Building defects was also an issue that uh, came up throughout these discussions and is something clearly that's now on the uh, forefront of many policymakers' minds uh, as a result of some of the issues there that we've seen in recent times. Other things that uh, contributed to this were some of the aspects of the planning process, both in terms of the challenges for planners encountered getting significant changes made to a development once the uh, plan had actually come to uh, the planners for review. So often by then many of the key decisions had been made and getting those improved was identified as a difficult thing to do. But similarly, challenges around trying to make sure that a whole range of small modifications that happen along the way didn't ultimately uh, accumulate and cause bad outcomes. Uh, so making sure that there was consistency in terms of how amendments to developments and decisions during the development process ultimately uh, changed the way that the building might operate. 
Another aspect of this issue was uh, around the timing of infrastructure provision. And this is something that sort of came up across the board. Uh, and this example from Strathfield was a really striking one of that, uh, where because of the failure to develop a number of buildings that had been planned and approved in the area, there also weren't the resources to uh, provide the public infrastructure that had been tied to those developments. And so residents in other buildings in the area that had com been completed and would have been able to enjoy that infrastructure ultimately um, weren't able to do so. And one of the examples of this was a grandmother in the neighbourhood who told us about how because the local park that had been planned had never materialised, she had to take her grandkids on the train to the, another suburb nearby in order to play with them in the park when she was babysitting. So you see the sort of the impacts that these kinds of issues can have on lower income residents. We can move to the next one, please. So now we come to the interface between uh, private buildings and the public domain and a number of different ways in with which this interface had the potential to cause challenges. Various stories uh, emerged about the fact that there was often a lack of clarity uh, amongst residents and strata managers about what the exact boundaries of the responsibilities were for a large apartment complex and the fact that planning and design strategies that tried to integrate apartments with the surrounding uh, public facilities actually sometimes contributed to that by having open areas that merged from private into public space and people being unclear where their maintenance obligations uh, started and finished. Similarly, uneven expectations about the standard of maintenance and potentially the resources available from a council relative to what uh, private residents might anticipate the maintenance would be when they moved into the area. A particular point of concern um, arose around privately owned public spaces, which is a uh, a model that's sometimes used when developers are contributing to uh, community benefits and will do so within the boundaries of a complex. And as a result of that, the, that public space is accessible by the public but owned by the private owners of the building who take on that responsibility often without understanding why it's come about and you know, potentially feeling uh, resentful or uncertain about how to manage that uh, that infrastructure so that the private, uh, both private owners and the public can use it. So uh, in general, um, the sense was that avoiding the creation of privately owned public spaces was a better outcome because you needed a clear delineation between what was public and what was private. And finally, issues around the activation of the streetscape and particularly uh, the sort of failure to really provide good quality retail in the ground floor of many of the mixed use buildings in the neighbourhoods that we looked at. And uh, a sense that perhaps we weren't planning clearly enough for exactly what types of retail would go into the developments during the development phase, but then also not having strategies to respond and to make different uses of those spaces if the um, anticipated retail interest didn't materialise. So talking through some ideas around how spaces that might otherwise end up being sort of lower end retail like convenience stores could perhaps be better repurposed as community spaces or other facilities that uh, residents in those neighbourhoods really need. Next slide, please. Infrastructure was a, a huge focus of these discussions and the challenges around getting good infrastructure in place, as well as the need and the real uh, value of having uh, lots of infrastructure, lots of public infrastructure and freely accessible services and facilities. And again, that's something that uh, lower income residents tend to have a high reliance on. So they're particularly affected if that infrastructure doesn't uh, emerge or isn't designed to suit their needs. Concerns were raised about uh, the way that both the development contributions mechanisms work and also the use and the impact of voluntary planning agreements. Both of those mechanisms were seen as uh, not providing enough certainty in terms of the type of funding that would be available 
the timing of that funding and that was part of the issue that arose in the Strathfield case study. And ultimately a sense that without really uh, extensive management and um, skilled oversight from council, those mechanisms weren't necessarily able to provide enough support to ensure that, that all of the infrastructure that was necessary would be provided. Similarly, there were um, some discussions around the design and of public spaces and making sure that they work for all of the different parts of the community. So thinking through strategies for ensuring that you don't, for example, have conflict between people who want to cycle in these spaces versus people who want to walk, people who want to exercise pets, uh, people who want spaces for their kids to play safely. So thinking through ways to separate and manage those different uses so that it works for everyone. The next slide, thanks. Another point of tension, uh, the challenges of uh, coordinating between different government agencies, different levels of government, and interestingly also within different parts of um, a particular part of government. So for example, uh, concerns around disagreements or um, different perspectives from people within local government responsible for planning who try to uh, encourage the introduction of as much infrastructure as possible. And then those who bear the responsibility for ensuring those spaces are maintained properly and the concerns that they would raise around the costs associated with that. So some of the discussion was about thinking through how to put mechanisms in place for ensuring that not only is infrastructure funded up front, but that uh, adequate maintenance costs are factored into how that uh, that infrastructure is funded so that it can be well looked after uh, once it's up and running as well. These tensions are, in many respect are not new and they're not necessarily uh, sort of a form of conflict but just the complexity of government uh, and the many different parts of government that are involved in the planning system. So trying to think through ways to make sure that everyone was speaking to the relevant parts and keeping everyone involved in the process uh, informed of how it was being developed and why certain decisions were being made. And next slide, please. And then the last uh, area of focus was around thinking about how we can build and manage higher density areas in ways that work both for current residents and for future communities. In this context, uh, the discussion again came back to this issue around gentrification that Hazel mentioned earlier, and particularly examples from the Carlton case studies of the fact that not only were many of the lower income residents in those areas feeling pressure in terms of uh, housing costs and a need for more affordable housing in the area, but also pressures as a result of other aspects of the neighbourhood changing through gentrification and a result of urban renewal, particularly the changing nature of the commercial uh, services available. So residents told us that while they used to be able to shop in the local area and be able to afford to buy uh, their supplies in the local area, they now had to travel a number of suburbs away because upgrading of the local shops had meant that they were no longer accessible to them because they become more expensive. Other aspects of this uh, issue around making sure that we plan for the future as well as the present included making sure that we're catering to all the different types of people living in high density now, uh, including children uh, and better management of some of the issues that arise with planning for children around noise and public space and the needs that children have. Similarly, making sure that the spaces and the buildings that we're constructing remain accessible to people as they age and allow them to age in place. And making sure that people can uh, sort of live full lives in high density, including making sure that these areas cater for people to have pets and um, be able to exercise those pets without, again, causing undue disruption to neighbours 
Next slide, please. Okay, so where did all of these discussions ultimately lead us? Well, the report sets up 41 recommendations. Uh, these are really framed as policy priorities. The idea being that uh, many of these ideas are not necessarily new. They're things that uh, policymakers and practitioners have known, but trying to bring them together in a way that highlights all of the things that we need to be thinking about when we try to cater to lower income residents in these areas. Some of the changes or priorities that we've identified are relatively easy to implement, uh, particularly some needs around giving people clearer and more detailed information, making sure people understand their rights and responsibilities as high residents and uh, people who manage or develop a high density housing. Some of, the, uh, some of the changes though are much bigger picture changes and um, again affordable housing comes to the forefront as one of the best strategies for ensuring that uh, low income people are well catered to in high density but also some uh, suggestions around ongoing management of these areas so that it's not simply a question of building it and then leaving it to a uh, you know, leaving residents to sort their own issues out. And again, this issue around the provision of local infrastructure and continuing to make sure that we provide the best possible infrastructure because of how important it is to all high density dwellers, but particularly lower income high density dwellers. Next slide, thanks. So, I guess if we tease out a couple of uh, broader themes that come from those recommendations, this idea around the importance and the value of good coordination and continuing to work towards better coordination. Again, it, it might not be a, a new idea, but it's something that uh, again and again was reinforced as being incredibly important to achieving the kinds of outcomes that we want for uh, our people who live in these high density neighbourhoods. And that includes coordination within government, but also between government and the private providers of much of the housing in these areas. And secondly, uh, the, the sense that when you look across these priorities, there is a clear um, message, I guess, that there is a responsibility for government to uh, focus in particular on making sure that these areas support lower income dwellers. We have a system of uh, predominantly private provision of higher density housing and by its nature that tends to work better for people who can afford to buy at the upper end of, uh, of those uh, developments and can support themselves with access to private services and for lower income people those things are not necessarily possible. So it's in that context of uh, of looking after lower income residents that government is especially important and needs to really see itself playing a proactive role in that space. Next slide, thanks. And why is that important? Why are these recommendations significant? Well, I guess the first point is we do think having looked at these case studies that it reaffirms that we can do density well. Uh, and we saw some examples of that in particular, I think, in the, the Rhodes West case study and some of the infrastructure that's been achieved in that location. But it really does require a huge amount of resources and commitment to do it well. And we have to be prepared as part of the way we think about planning and development to make sure that those resources and the efforts required are actually uh, put in place so that we do achieve those good outcomes. And we think it's also important because if we don't do it, we do argue that you will see some real costs associated with this. So it's an equity issue, as Hazel said, and it's not simply something that we should want to do, but it's something that we need to do to make sure that our cities uh, operate effectively, efficiently, and ultimately uh, we think it's somewhere a space where can, uh, putting in place and spending the money up front and putting the place in place the requirements and the, the rules that we need to achieve these outcomes will ultimately save us um, in both in terms of social and economic costs down the line. 
And I think we've seen with some of the events around uh, recent months with COVID-19, just how important public space is, just how important good infrastructure is. And uh, so I feel hopeful that we can take some of the lessons out of that and use that to try and achieve some of the goals that we're talking about in this research. Thanks very much. I think now we can move into questions. Great, thank you very much. Um, and I just invite Laura and Hazel to switch on their uh, cameras as well as I've just done as we uh, look to um, address the questions that are coming in. We've had a few questions come in uh, to this point, but um, I'd also like to remind people to uh, use the question function in the uh, webinar software to raise your questions uh, with today's presenters. But anyway, initially, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. And um, there's uh, a lot to think about in there. Uh, one of the first questions to come through uh, looked at the the issue of um, our planning and building systems and whether in fact we need more stringent uh, controls uh, in place at either state and or local government level. Do you have any thoughts about that? Did you want me? I'll jump in on that one. Uh, either look, I think it's a really Thank interesting you. question. Uh, it depends a bit what you mean by more stringent controls. I guess uh, in particularly in relation to the issues around the provision of infrastructure, I think we need a lot more clarity about how that system works and in particular uh, more strict requirements for having the infrastructure in place at the time people start to move into developments. So this time lag that we've often seen between when housing is completed and then the surrounding infrastructure eventually uh, gets put in place is really problematic. Uh, so I think shifting the way that those mechanisms work so that A, the funding is available and B, it's available at the time needed to make sure that that infrastructure comes online in a timely manner is really important. The flip side of that though, is that we did have a number of discussions uh, with planners and policymakers about the fact that allowing some flexibility in the system is good. Uh, because there are changes in neighbourhoods, there's infrastructure that seems like a good idea at the start of the planning process and by the end you realise that you need more or uh, you need slightly different facilities to what you had initially anticipated. So I think there needs to be more clarity about what's trying to be achieved and how you're going to go about achieving it, but then ultimately a little bit of flexibility in terms of what that translates into on the ground but probably less flexibility around the timing issues so that things are actually uh, available when people need them, not a year later or three years later, or mm. in the case of Strathfield, you know, 10 years later, and some residents in that area are still waiting. Mm. And uh, as a quick follow-up to that, uh, and uh, to pick up some of the other questions that are coming in, uh, can you identify sort of specific uh, deficiencies in relation to the um, design or, or the nature of some of the apartments that uh, you looked at in your case studies that were particularly uh, impacting on the lower income households? I can have a go at that one. Um, so in addition to building defects, uh, which impact on everyone, but uh, possibly impact on the lower end of the market more, mm. Other um, significant issues are around noise um, and especially appropriate design near noisy places. So for example, um, some of the apartments that have been delivered in the upper Strathfield area have a train line on one side and Parramatta Road on the other. And that train line is used for um, heavy goods throughout the night, um, not only for passenger trains. Mm. So the residents in those buildings um, we're in buildings that didn't have double glazing, that didn't have very good sound insulation, and they were disturbed by those noises. Now, um, it could be anticipated that putting a building in a place like that would result in noise, uh, transmission from outside, um, and it would have been sensible to have, um, to have engineered those buildings to withstand that noise disturbance. And that hasn't happened because the minimum noise requirements um, are insufficient for a a position like that for an apartment building. So that's a that's one one example. Um, 
other, other things that were important um, were buildings that didn't have any or very little shared spaces within the buildings. Um, again, in the Strathfield case, that was a particular problem because of the absence of shared spaces in the public domain. So one of the things that we talked about in our workshops was how do you balance um, provision of shared spaces in the public domain and the private domain, and what types of shared spaces work best. Um, our, our position, I think, was that it's better to provide those in the public domain, um, but if they're not provided in either, that is really problematic. Mm. Okay, thanks. Um, there's a few questions that have been coming in, I guess, around the, the role of, uh, of government, I, I presume state government, um, by the nature of the questions, uh, in, in relation to providing housing for, um, for lower income uh, households. And uh, the, I guess the, the fact that you, I, you looked in your case studies at a mixture of, um, of both public housing um, projects and uh, existing mainly and um, and also new uh, market housing and uh, there's just some themes emerging here around uh, what role uh, the state could take in um, providing more housing whether it's uh, individual uh, dwellings within uh, market housing blocks or through um, provision of more social housing in, in high density um, types of development. Uh, are there things you'd like to comment on in terms of um, you know, future policy or, or potential um, changes in the role of, of state government um, in relation to apartment type of housing uh, and, uh, and public ownership? I'm sure we've both got something to say on that. Um, yes. I'll, I'll kick off. Um, yeah. there, there is definitely a, a need for more government provision or government support of housing that's specifically targeted at lower income households. Um, so social housing and affordable housing. Um, th this is something that uh, Ahuri projects have been <laughs> arguing yeah. for for a very long time and there, there's a big history behind that. So definitely in our report, we tried to make the point that that was very, very important and remains very important. Mm -hmm. We also tried to make the point that so long as the government is not doing that and relying on the private market, there still needs to be a government role in ensuring that that private mm -hmm. market housing is delivering those outcomes. And at the moment, there hasn't been a focus on doing that either. So mm -hmm. we need, I mean, ideally, we would provide significantly more government supported or provided affordable housing. But in the absence of that, there's still a government role for ensuring that privately provided housing meets the needs of those groups. There's a specific question here that is perhaps a question of clarification about your research too, which um, particularly when you were talking about the Sydney cases, you identified that um, there was uh, quite a mix of uh, different uh, income groups and households with different incomes uh, within the apartment buildings that you looked at and um, I just uh, the, the question is, uh, is is asking well isn't, isn't this actually a good thing that there's um, a real uh, diversity and mix of uh, different um, types of households uh, and different households with different incomes uh, living in, in proximity like that? Uh, yes. <laughs> Um, it, it gets a little complicated. It's it's definitely a good thing. Um, it's good that we haven't got a division between our lower mm. income households in one area and our higher income in the other. Mm. I think that that's very positive. Um, and we see the benefits of that in both of our Sydney case studies, um, even in Strathfield, which we've been quite down on, um, you can see the benefits of that in that area. Um, I think Possibly a, a bigger issue is about how those properties are being used rather than the incomes of the people living in them. So if you have properties that are overcrowded, for example, um, that has impacts on, on how those buildings can operate or how they can be managed. Um, if you have uh, families with children living in buildings and people on night shift work at the same time, that can cause tension. So it's mm. about managing those relationships within the building. So, I would say overall, yes, it is great that there's a mixture and that we should be encouraging that, but we also need to have building design and building management and precinct management um, strategies in mm. place 
to manage those com potentially conflicting uses of space. And just to add to that, Tom, I, I I'd yeah. completely agree with that and say that I think also that it is a good thing that we have that kind of integration of lower and higher um, income earners living in these neighbourhoods. Uh, but I think because of that, that's part of the reason that maybe some of the challenges that lower income people uh, face in these sort of locations is easy to overlook because it's not so visible as if you had a kind of a, a clear concentration of lower income people mm. living in one in one place. And because of that, it, it's been possible for some of these sorts of uh, needs that we're talking about that aren't well catered to at the moment have kind of gone unaddressed because there is, you know, at the same time that there are lower income people in these areas, there are people who are living much more comfortably and, you know, taking mm. advantage of many private services in those areas that mean they have a substantively different quality of life. Mm. Can I um, then also shift the conversation from the dwelling to the community infrastructure that um, that is there um, supporting people as well and um, there's a, some, a few questions around that but uh, one that I think is interesting that asks if you were able to identify uh, what were the most um, important or valued uh, types of infrastructure, uh, community infrastructure uh, within the cases that you looked at? Yeah, Overall, absolutely. Parks. Yeah. Parks are very important. Um, parks, open, yeah. open space and space, um, space that's big enough to, to exercise. Um, but in roads, the community centre, which was delivered very well, was also very highly regarded. And the other one I'd say that was raised mm. a number of times was libraries. So even though in many respects our libraries have ceased to be what we used to think of a library, uh, it, mm. they've proven to be really diverse public spaces and they get used for all sorts of things from teaching people to use technology, to having meetings, to having events, to looking up to kids. Mm. And, uh, and you do need to make sure, I guess, as part of thinking through the infrastructure planning that you do have places outdoors where people can enjoy themselves for free, but also indoors, because there's lots of times of the year when being in the park is not the number one place you'd like to spend a good chunk of time. Mm. And libraries are, are important, um, especially if they provide free Wi-Fi and if they provide study space uh, for people who might be in, in crowded households. Mm. There's a few questions here, and I'll, I'll, I might get to a couple of them in a minute that uh, are looking at quite, uh, I guess, specific, um, you know, planning instruments and uh, and other things that operate within the areas where you've um, conducted your research. But there are some other questions that are asking about, um, I guess, the applicability of what you've studied um, to other parts of Australia. You've obviously focused on Sydney and Melbourne for obvious reasons that you've explained, but. Um, how, how do you think uh, some of the findings of your research uh, will translate uh, to other states, um, other cities and, and other places perhaps that are, are not such big cities but um, where there is nonetheless some um, housing development occurring that uh, fits your definition of, um, of high density? Uh, well, I mean, we chose to focus on um, what's being built now, which is that the mm. higher density and the precinct mm. kind of scale, higher density developments. Yep. But actually a lot of our findings and recommendations are just as valid for a six pack unit somewhere in a suburb in Adelaide. Yep. It, you know, they're, they're still at that building level, they're still relevant at, um, at lower density and not within the precinct level. Um, and also, although the majority of these types of areas are in Sydney and Melbourne, I would see Sydney and Melbourne being possibly the the front runners, but other cities are going to be following along in the not too distant future. I mean, the the way that Sydney and Melbourne look now in terms of apartment developments is almost unrecognisable compared to 20 years mm. ago. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, some questions too around the role of local government, and I guess um, you obviously only looked at two local governments in relation to the case studies you examined, but um, there's some questions around the role that that local government uh, can play and um, some of those, uh, some of the interest that we've had from the audience is in relation uh, to the, the role of local government in um, assisting or enabling um, more 
uh, so, uh, social and affordable uh, housing um, within um, within development, um, particularly in relation um, the issue of uh, nimbyism has been raised uh, in the questions as well, and um, and how that impacts on uh, attempts. Oh, we've lost you, Tom. <laughs> Hopefully, oh, Frank can yeah. still hear us. We might try and answer Tom's question while he comes back. Um, <laughs> we have actually have a good example of that in the Melbourne case studies, in that the City of Melbourne is um, actively looking at bringing in mandatory inclusionary zoning, for example, um, which is which is a great advocacy position um, and something that that um, I think we would support as a research team. Um, in terms of the role of, of local government, I think yep. it was quite interesting actually in our conversation article, one of the, the comments said, oh, local government should just be doing rates, roads and, um, and waste. And, and I would disagree, local government does a lot more than that. Um, mm. It plays an important advocacy role, it can play an important role in terms of um, zoning and encouraging uh, more affordable housing provision. And also it plays a really important role in terms of community development. Um, and and supporting infrastructure for that type of community development. So the best cases we had of that across our four case studies were again in roads um, where Canada Bay Council has both a dedicated place manager for the area and also a community consultation group um, who have a direct line to council um, to discuss mm -hmm. relevant planning um, and community issues within the area. And we see that as best practice but that's, that's only possible because the council threw um, substantial financial and um, staffing resources behind it. And many councils either can't or choose not to um, afford that. And that brings us back to the, the funding question mm. and, the, and the prioritization of these things. Do you, do you want to yeah. add to that, Laura? No, I think you, yeah, you've captured it nicely. Good, very good. Um, look, I mentioned there were a few uh, questions that were focusing on, I guess, some of the specific um, instruments that are in place in the New South Wales and uh, Victorian uh, systems, and uh, it, it, it's hard to hard to ask those jointly without getting uh, too specific. But um, if I can, I guess, uh, try and ask you um, around the uh, the functioning of um, of SEP 65 and the, the functioning of the Better Apartment Design Standards in Victoria, um, are, are these uh, instruments um, working? Um, and ha have you, um, through the, the work that, that the research that you did, um, identified um, uh, any, any issues or uh, any opportunities uh, for doing things better or, or indeed even uh, ways that, that, that these instruments are working well um, in the two states? Uh, I can speak to SEP65. Um, yep. Our other author, Megan, I'm not sure if she's on the line, would be better to speak about um, sure. the Victorian guide. Uh, so SEP65 in, in general does appear to have improved um, outcomes uh, and it provides surety around what's required in terms of very important things like solar access um, and cross ventilation. Uh, there's always an argument um, that that with any regulation comes a lack in, in a, a reduction in, in innovation or, or potential for innovation, and um, it's possible that that's the case. But I do think that SEP 65 has overall um, improved the quality, especially at the lower end um, of the market. The, mm. the Melbourne Design Guidelines were introduced um, much later. Uh, and so, as I say, I'm not sure if I'm the... I don't know if you want to add to that, Laura. I would just add that I think, you know, um, the contrast prior to the introduction of the Melbourne uh, Guidelines yep. in quality of design of apartments in Sydney and Melbourne does speak to the fact that while SEP 65 might not be perfect, it, it has, um, it, you know, added real value in terms of ensuring some sort of standards and basic uh, needs of apartment design are actually being met and some of the issues around very very small apartments in Melbourne uh, rooms without any direct access to the outside uh, some of those things I think um, you know have been avoided in the Sydney context as a result of that regulation so the fact that Melbourne has followed 
Sydney's lead, if you like, in introducing that kind of requirements, um, I think speaks to the fact that it does it does work and overall lifts the standards of uh, design that we're getting in apartments. And on the question of uh, apartment density, um, the uh, some questions around that. I mean, you obviously defined high density. Um, you gave your definition as um, in terms of the, the number of stories of the building, but but in terms of the density of um, of buildings or of of precincts, indeed, um, then is there a or have you um, through through the research pro process have have you identified um, or, or developed uh, a, a bit more of an understanding on on what the um, I guess limits are to density and and whether there's um, a point of uh, a point where things are too dense, and that that starts to uh, create problems that that perhaps are particularly then felt um, more keenly by lower income households, but which um, are just generally problematic, I suppose. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the short answer is no, and the reason why the answer is no mm -hmm. is that the answer really depends on the design of the buildings, the quality of the buildings and the nature of the residents and the mix of the residents and also the, the population density, the number of people living yep. within each unit within the buildings. So, you know, you could I'll go back to the six pack, you can have a six pack, six units apartment building that's completely dysfunctional for all of those reasons and you can have a 300 unit apartment building that's completely functional. So, yeah, we don't have a, um, a clear density cutoff that's ideal. Just to add to that as well, um, I, I would just say that I agree, but I think that if you're thinking about density at a sort of a neighbourhood scale, the, the more you ramp it up, the more challenging it is to provide the commensurate infrastructure. And, uh, you know, you move from sort of needing to think about just predominantly infrastructure needs at the local level with parks, community yeah. centres and all of that things to um, major sort of state or metro level infrastructure requirements around getting people in and out of these neighbourhoods, connecting, uh, you know, transport lines and all of those sorts of things, thinking about bigger picture issues around waste management. And so I think that, yes, you can do all of those things, but uh, we, we need to be cognizant of the fact that it gets increasingly complex the bigger you go. And we mm. need to make sure that we're putting the resources behind that kind of planning to make sure we do it properly. Yeah, the spare infrastructure argument um, for high density development often falls down um, mm. quicker than you'd think it would. So, you know, the, the spare the spare yeah. capacity yeah. that there is capacity. in the sewage yeah. systems and the water systems yeah. and the electricity systems and the transport systems, it's not, it's not um, infinite. And that's an issue that we've heard in relation to many of the high density areas that we've looked at, that there's sometimes an assumption that, you know, we can use the existing infrastructure. And in fact, there's a real need to upgrade all of that infrastructure and that the costs associated with that are quite significant. So. And if it's not it's upgraded, not, the idea is to build in greenfield are... development. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a few questions coming in around gentrification, which is uh, you know, obviously a topic you touched on and, and the fact that um, a lot of this apartment development uh, is occurring. Well, I think, I think the point that we made in the presentation mm -hmm. that um, commercial gentrification is also an issue, mm -hmm. um, especially yeah. in the Melbourne yeah. studies is yeah. important. Mm -hmm. Are you back, Tom? Yeah. Yes, I'm sorry, did I drop out there? You did. Yeah, 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 we didn't answer your yeah, question because yeah, we couldn't okay. hear it. Sorry. Yeah, no, just a question. Uh, this is a few questions. A few people raising this question of gentrification and how that is uh, impacting perhaps on the some of the higher uh, costs associated with uh, building management fees and also um, with uh, yeah, the general sort of cost of living in a particular area. And I, I know you've touched um, a bit on the latter in your presentation, but can you discuss the former as well? I think the uh, the issue that you mentioned there, Tom, about um, mm. thinking through the, the costs of living in high density, not just in relation to the initial getting yep. into the building, but in the ongoing costs for owners in terms of strata yep. levies, uh, maintenance costs and those sorts of things is probably something that we still need to do better. And that 
we need to make sure that people really understand what those ongoing financial responsibilities are because we, we certainly did hear stories about people who ha had not anticipated that the, the need to contribute financially to the upkeep of the building over time would be as significant as it was and that that then sort of compounded their financial difficulties um, in, in unfortunate ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what, what is the role of these, um, um, I guess, uh, you know, building managers, um, perhaps in, um, yeah, what, what is their role in the equation and, and can they, uh, they play a role that um, can assist in addressing um, a number of the issues that you've identified? So there's, there's two kinds of managers in apartment buildings. There's building managers and there's strata managers. Um, mm -hmm. And generally, if you're talking about apartment buildings with lower income residents, they, they won't have a building manager uh, because they, you have to pay for your building manager and your strata manager. Um, building managers essentially are managing the building itself um, and strata managers are making mm -hmm. sure that the um, uh, decisions are being made according to the law, um, that the budgets are adequate to maintain um, the building and, and these kinds of issues. Both are very important. Um, strata managers and building managers can provide a really important input at the beginning in the design and planning stages for new buildings. They have a good idea about what types of um, uh, design features or facilities are likely to um, cost what to maintain. Um, and they can provide some really good advice about um, not making the types of mistakes like needing a specialist cherry picker to change a light bulb, um, but you know, much, much more um, uh, significant changes. You know, putting timers on your um, CO2 extraction fan in the car park, for example, can save a huge amount of energy off your energy bills. Doesn't cost that much up front. Um, all of these kinds of uh, small tweaks that can be made, they can provide an important role at that initial stage. And then once the buildings are operating, they also provide an important role in terms of um, communicating with owners and, and with um, estate agents and, and through them tenants um, in terms of making sure that buildings are operating correctly, dealing with any um, problems that might be happening, uh, noise breaches or other kinds of vital breaches in the buildings. So yeah, they're, they're, they play a central, central role in ensuring that these types of buildings um, are operating and operating well. The other thing I'd just add to that is we did hear of examples uh, in our case study areas where strata managers in particular were kind of being particularly proactive and also playing a, a really valuable role in kind of facilitating social cohesion in apartment blocks. Okay. So helping to get events organised, barbecues for the residents, um, you know, thinking through different ways that the spaces in the apart in the complex could be used uh, that would appeal to different groups of residents, bringing different residents together. Uh, so there's that sort of social aspect to the role that they can potentially play as well, um, depending on okay. whether that's something that the, the complex facilitates. They can also play a really important facilitating role in upgrading buildings. Um, so just things like you know light, lighting upgrades, which can save a lot on um, costs or other mm. types of maintenance and upgrade um, and retrofit projects. Um, many strata management companies now include that on their AGM as, a, as an item um, to be discussed at the, at the meeting of the strata owners. I, I think I'm back on now. Um, apologies for that. Yeah. No worries. Um, yeah, um, so sorry about that, everybody. Um, look, we'll, we'll start winding up now, but I just wanted to quickly ask um, uh, about, I guess, some of the specific um, cohorts of people that you identified um, that it is important to design for. Um, you mentioned um, the ageing population, um, older people, you mentioned uh, children. Um, so, uh, you know, are there, what are the, um, I guess, you know, are there specific things that, that are required to um, appropriately address the needs of, of those sorts of groups? And um, yeah, I'll just ask that for now. But I also wanted, I'm also interested in the the the, um, the international student um, uh, or student population rather that you you identified um, as well. And uh, if uh, if you had some thoughts about about their needs as a group too. Mm. 
I might pick up on a group that um, we did mention in the presentation, but mm. um, you haven't just asked about, which is uh, mm. especially um, multi-generational uh, yep. migrant families. Um, yes. In the Sydney case studies especially, what we discovered was that um, although they're not picked up necessarily in the census data, there was a large um, number of grandparents um, who were coming um, from uh, Asia, mostly China, on three-month mm -hmm. visits, often two, three-month visits or a six-month visit each year to assist in caring for grandchildren. So there are quite a significant population in the area um, and they're a population that is now being catered for um, by the community services um, in, in the area, but uh, not, not necessarily anticipated, I guess. Um, and so the types of things that have been helpful are um, uh, dancing, um, you know, social activities where those people can come and meet each other um, and build up social networks during the day with the children. Um, when they're okay. doing those caring responsibilities. So that was quite interesting. Um, so in terms that, of... That entails a space in which to do that. Yeah, yeah. So um, in, as I said, in, in roads that was happening at the community centre and in the park, mm. but in Strathfield, the, the, those people were having to leave the area in order to do that kind mm. of thing because there wasn't any local facility for it. Um, in terms of international students, uh, one of the things that was raised was that those, well, I guess all university students, was that they can move quite often. Um, so there was a lot of turnover in buildings that had a lot of students in them. Um, and that could cause practical problems like, for example, people throwing a lot of household goods out on the street um, fairly regularly and that needing to be managed. That's one of the things that strata managers told us that they were, they were dealing with um, as a management issue. Um, and also a high turnover of residents. It's hard to keep track of who's who's living in the buildings. And so, you know, there are there are things that you can do to try and assist with that. Um, having hard waste collection opportunities or spaces for that kind of collection mm -hmm. within apartment buildings is quite important, especially in areas that are likely to have a lot of turnover. Things like online swap, um, yeah. you know, sites that people can, rather than throwing things out, can trade things. Um, I think the other thing that sort of came up and we had a picture relating to this in relation to some of those kinds of groups was that often and lower income people in general are less likely to have a car. Um, and there was yeah. some, some clear evidence around the fact that some of the planning decisions meant that it was very difficult for people without a car to transport shopping from the shops back to their homes. And so then you get the issue of people taking shopping trolleys and leaving them all over the neighbourhood because that's the only way they can get from A to B with all their stuff. So again, thinking about you know the fact that there are lots of people with different transport capacities and needs in these neighbourhoods and what they're going to have to do to overcome those obstacles if we don't plan for them in advance. Hmm. Okay. Well, just before we finish up, um, just a couple of uh, a couple of things around development process that I um, want to ask in order to um, hopefully cover off on. Um, a number of the of the questions that we've had and my apologies of course to to all of our questioners there's been uh, far more questions than, than we've been able to address in this time um, but uh, but there are some questions around the development uh, process and um, the I guess tendency for um, and you did pick up on this in your presentation for um, you know design uh, decisions to um, to change or to um, um, to slip during the um, the process from the initial um, development um, discussions with councils through uh, to the actual realisation of the building. Um, so I guess a broad comment around how those uh, design, um, particularly design issues uh, to do with apartment buildings are um, upheld uh, through that process. And if you examine that indeed um, at all in, in relation to the case studies that you looked at, and, and, and associated with that, questions around uh, the role of uh, design review panels, um, which I know operate um, in New South Wales, perhaps more in Victoria, um, in, in terms of, um, uh, in, in, as part of step 65. So can you, can you comment, um, I'll, I'll try and I guess crystallise that a bit better. Uh, can you comment on whether you um, observed uh, in these cases uh, that um, 
uh, you know, design intentions had been uh, like, watered down or or um, that uh, decisions in the process had actually changed um, outcomes adversely in terms of um, the, the apartments that were delivered. And, uh, and did you uh, observe anything in terms of the role of uh, design review panels and whether they uh, were able to uh, make a contribution or provide some um, oversight across that process? Uh, yeah, look, I think I, I'm trying to think of a specific example of that issue coming up and it's not coming to mind, but certainly as a, as a general point that that concern was raised, that there is this sort of tinkering process that happens throughout the planning and that ultimately the, the sort of cumulative effect of those small changes can um, be greater than anticipated. A couple of things uh, that flow from that. I think we, we do talk in the report about the value of, um, of place managers and in fact there's that being something that mm -hmm. actually happens and gets put in place as the development is occurring and not just after the fact. So uh, some of these issues I think definitely re reflect the fact that there is not enough ongoing um, participation from the same people both in the private sector and <laughs> in the public sector so that you have that kind of longer term oversight of the project from start to finish and then into the operational phase as well and so place managers is one way of trying to achieve that um, but also I think you know thinking about ways to make sure that we don't have multiple different people getting involved throughout who don't necessarily understand the full history of the development. Uh, in relation to um, design review panels that was something that came up and was seen as a kind of a, having a positive effect um, and as part of that I think you know we had discussions particularly around the benefits of having both designers but also then sort of maintenance experts involved in those kinds of reviews so again that you tackle some of those issues that crop up where uh, you know the, the longer term thinking about how this is going to work and how it's going to change over time can actually and be managed over time can be incorporated up front and decisions made to try and cater to that. Okay. Yep. Good. Hmm, sorry, Hazel. I was just going to add to that. I mean, um, this is also yes. an issue when it comes to building defects as well, in that the, yep. there's um, often, in, in private delivery of housing, there's often a disjuncture between the people who are designing and delivering the housing and the people who ultimately are going to be living in it and managing it. Yep. Um, they're, they're, there's often no in interaction between the two groups um, and so having having roles or, or people who span across those two stages is really important um, with some of the um, good development practice um, that you can see you see developers who take it upon themselves to consider what the ongoing um, uh, functionality of their buildings is going to be um, and, and that has reputational benefits but that's not necessarily the case across all um, developers or across all of their sites um, so place managers are important um, strata managers can also play that kind of bridging role um, and and there's the potential for, for other um, agents to come in and play those kinds of roles as well and with the reforms that we're seeing to um, building quality in New South Wales, perhaps we'll see more um, more of those kind of bridging agents mm. coming into the fore, which would be good to see. Mm. Yeah, and certainly that sort of uh, greater regularity and consistency of checking the building as the construction process is going ahead, I think will also help contribute to that um, and comparing mm. it, you know, against what was actually planned and making sure that, uh, you know, that those sorts of modifications haven't happened without people recognising it as the process goes along. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I think we might um, have to wind it up now, but um, the I, I just want to acknowledge too that we've had a, a number of uh, comments uh, come in um, and a few questions, but um, also uh, touching on the, the issue of uh, environmental sustainability and, um, and apartments and uh, um, whether and, and how uh, these apartments are actually um, uh, addressing those sorts of issues and, uh, and whether in fact um, lower income households um, perhaps uh, more um, adversely affected in that way. Um, 
maybe if you can just um, maybe make a couple of uh, concluding remarks that um, that touch on the issue of uh, environmental sustainability, that would be really great. Sure. Um, so there is a need to to pay a lot of consideration to sustainability outcomes of apartment buildings. Um, the studies that I'm aware of that have been undertaken in New South Wales have demonstrated that um, uh, higher density buildings perform um, poorly in terms of energy efficiency, um, partly because they have so many so many common areas that require energy um, to operate lights, uh, lifts, um, car park exhaust fans and, and the like. Uh, so it is certainly something we can't just assume that because people live in apartments they're having a smaller footprint um, on the environment. Um, at the dwelling level at least they may be having a greater footprint. Um, in terms of what's being delivered, I think in the market sector um, we have to think about what the drivers are for that. Um, are is there a market for that? And the answer is yes, but it tends to be at the upper ends of the market, not at the lower income ends of the market. Um, and so I think that the, the way to get around that is, is going to have to be regulation rather than market drivers to improve that performance. The other important issue in that space is um, retrofitting apartment buildings and whether new buildings are being built so that they can be retrofitted. So are they being built with a consideration to their maintenance, their energy and their water efficiency and um, etc. And are they also being built in such a way that they can be retrofitted to enable um, technological advances to be incorporated when they become more affordable? For example, electrical vehicle charging stations or um, solar panels on, on roofs. Um, and in a lot of cases, the answer to that is still no, which is unfortunate. Mm. Mm. Laura, do you have any uh, final comments on that? No, other than just to say, I think, you know, you start to see how all of these things do go hand in hand. So we sort of talked about the, um, you know, the social and economic costs of not doing this as well as we could. And, uh, you know, unstated, but I think clearly involved there also are the environmental costs. Uh, and, you know, given that this is a huge focus of how we're developing our bigger cities now, uh, the potential for, uh, um, you know, having a much improved outcome in terms of the longer term environmental sustainability is is there and it would be really great to grab it now while we can. Hmm. All right well we've reached the end of our webinar and uh, so I do want to thank you both very much uh, Laura and Hazel for your presentation and uh, and the time you've put into today and, um, and your uh, time discussing uh, the questions that were raised. Um, I apologise to Thanks our so. listeners, uh, some, some of those disruptions uh, at the end. And also um, I, I, there were a lot of questions that came in and I do apologise that I've not been able to tackle all of the, uh, the issues and particularly some of the more um, detailed specific questions that were raised. So, um, but thank you uh, very much for uh, participating in the webinar. And just quickly, I want to remind you um, that we would really appreciate your feedback uh, by completing the short survey that gets sent to you today. And also um, to remind you that um, the webinar, a recording of this webinar will be available um, on our website at Ahuri and you can uh, listen again, or you can uh, share that obviously with other colleagues. So thank you again. And until we see you again in person, we. Um, Thank you very much for joining us on the webinar today. Goodbye.